Uh, welcome uh, to the first lecture in this year's series of speakers sponsored by the Nonfiction Writing Program at Brown. Thank you for coming. My name is Carol DeBoer Langworthy, and I'm a lecturer in the Nonfiction Writing Program here. Oh, good. Welcome. Come on in. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is Ted Gupp a renowned investigative reporter who's also the chair of the journalism department at Emerson College in Boston. But before we get to that, let me remind everyone to silence or preferably turn off your cell phone now, please. Thank you. I hope mine doesn't go off. <laughs> Most of you in this audience already know about the nonfiction writing program, which is celebrating its 20th year of existence within the English department in the coming academic year. From a hodgepodge of various writing courses, in 1997, senior lecturers Larry Stanley and Elizabeth Taylor crafted a three-pronged program that has grown and developed into a comprehensive undergraduate track within the English department. Courses are offered in varieties of academic writing in many stripes of creative nonfiction, in journalism, and in electronic digital media. We now have a clearly established course path for students from introductory to advanced writing courses, out of which we have built up a body of genuinely advanced writers. Our graduates find work on newspapers and other news outlets, in public relations and advertising, and as freelance writers of many hues. A number go on for advanced degrees and become teachers and professional authors themselves. So that's us. And tonight, we open this year's lecture series, which has a theme, writing diversity. We believe that writers confront the issues of our time and of our history all the time. Whether you are covering the Baltimore uprising on your cell phone, or writing about a past in historical narrative, or crafting self-reflective writing and essays. This year, we hope to open up conversations about issues of diversity in these lectures, I shall leave the exact definition of diversity to others, namely our nine speakers, and suspect that our personal definitions of this word may change as the series unfolds. So tonight, we're honored to have Ted Gupp, a seasoned investigative reporter who is currently teaching an advanced writing course for us in investigative reporting as our inaugural speaker. His topic is diversity, prejudice, and the open mind, one journalist's personal struggle. Ted started investigative journalism under the legendary Woodward and Bernstein on the Washington Post, and from there moved to Time Magazine in a similar vein, and then began publishing books and articles and teaching journalism, ultimately ending up thus far at Emerson. His specialty, if any, seems to be delicate issues of essentially ethics in public life, particularly regarding issues of national security and particularly personal responsibility. A little background, he was an English major, although he double majored in classics at Brandeis University and received a master's in classics from Trinity University in Ireland. In addition to his passionate journalism, he has scholarly interests in American and English poetry and he will be spending spring, spring term at Durham University in England, pursuing that other passion. He has won many prizes and fellowships for his work and published three books. His 2010 book, Nation of Secrets, The Threat to Democracy and the American Way of Life, won the Goldsmith Book Prize from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. But I'll shut up now and let Ted tell us more about his life. So please welcome our first speaker, on writing diversity, Ted Gupp. Thank you very much. Uh, would it be possible, forgive me for, for starting this way, but would it be possible for you all to move down here a bit? If you have to, to leave early, I understand, but otherwise, I'd love it if you could come down. It would make it a lot easier for me to, to speak to you uh, instead of at you. Um, so, if you would. Thank you. And is this uh, 
adequate the uh, the sound okay good Well, first I wanted to say um, that it's a pleasure to be here, uh, genuinely, and, um, and I feel very privileged to be able to teach here this semester. Uh, I have wonderful students, a few of whom I've been browbeating who are in this class, this, this room right now. Um, second, as I tell my wife who is here this evening, uh, lower expectations. Um, I'm going to be candid. I'm going to tell you what I really think about some things, but you must understand that I'm terribly confused on the issue of diversity. Confused, conflicted, full of contradictory uh, emotions. So uh, rather than present something neat and polished, I'm just going to present what is. So bear with me on that. Um, I have three really distinct talks that I'm giving. Um, they're interrelated, as you'll see. The first one. Um, is about my experiences growing up in America. It's about me. Uh, the second one is about my experiences in the newsroom, particularly as they relate to issues of diversity. And the third is some reflections about the nature of diversity. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to start with me. I'm 66. I'm a mid-century baby. I was born in 1950. I am white. I'm Jewish. I'm male. The DNA test that I did, the 23andMe, tells me what I already expected, which is that I'm 98% Ashkenazi Jew and 99.5% European, with a smattering of 0.5% North African thrown in for spice. That's me. For the better part of a couple thousand years, my ancestors have pretty much stuck to their own, both because of internal social pressures and because of internal, or external rather, social taboos. So there was not a lot of diversity in my family historically for a couple thousand years. What I'd like to do is, is give you just a quick snapshot of the origins of my family in this country, not because I think they're unique or original, but on the contrary, because I think that I represent a kind of prototypical story of America. So that's where I'll begin. The first member of my family to come to America was named Samuel Stern. That name Samuel keeps creeping into, into generations. It's my middle name. He was my great-great-grandfather. He came from Germany. He landed on our shores, that is America, on June 21st, 1849. He came here alone. He was 16 years old. He became a clothes merchant in a small Illinois town. He didn't change America any more than, than the other immigrants, although cumulatively he certainly helped define it. And he was certainly changed by America. In the spring of 1852, he sued someone for not paying the bill. He had a small clothing store, and they hadn't paid him. And he won his case thanks to a very able local lawyer, a lanky gentleman. You might have heard of him. His name was Abraham Lincoln. And that's recorded in the Abraham Lincoln log of April 24th, 1852, where my great-great-grandfather was his client. The last of my ancestors came to this country uh, in, about in 1902. And he was known as Sam Stone, another Samuel. But when he got off the boat, he was actually Schmuel Finkelstein, which may be a good reason why he changed it to Sam Stone. He was also a Fuzgeier, which means a footwalker. He came to this country to escape the pogroms of Romania. Fuzgeier means footwalker. He literally walked out of Romania with what little he had on his back. He was escaping pogroms and laws that said he couldn't own land, he couldn't go to school, he couldn't hold a job. He wanted to come to America, but America didn't want him. This is a recurring theme in my talk because it's a recurring theme in American history. The Secretary of State at the time was a fellow named John Hay. He pleaded with Romania to ease up on the Jews, not because he gave a darn about the Jews, but because he didn't want them coming here. 
and that's, that was a very real fear. The New York Times headline covering his, his remarks, Secretary Hayes, the headline read, present harsh treatment breeds men who are not desirable immigrants to this country. He went on to call them, quote, paupers, criminals, and the incurably diseased. So Donald Trump was not the first. My grandfather was one of those incurably diseased who came to this country, settled in Canton, Ohio, and just as a footnote, in 1933, in the depths of the Great Depression, when people had their backs against the wall and they were struggling, he played the role of Secret Santa, helping out 150 families, getting them through the Christmas of 1933. The Secret Santa, who was actually an Orthodox Jew. It was his way of thanking a Gentile community for accepting him. So, all of this sounds like a romanticization of the American myth of diversity. We, we all know or have referenced the words on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty about giving us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, but that's actually never been the way it is. America has always been profoundly resistant and apprehensive about taking in foreigners. Um, as my grandfather would indicate, and indeed among those who were least happy to see people like my grandfather get off the boat were the German Jews already here because they feared he would embarrass them because he was superstitious, he was semi-literate, he was backward, and they were afraid, being insecure, that he would somehow take away from their own American status. I'll just tell you about one other grandfather, that's Marcus, who came here in the 1880s. He became a tailor in Mobile, Alabama. He made outfits for the Mardi Gras. And his son, you're going to be very surprised to hear this, his son was named Samuel. And he would become a rabbi in a place you've heard of called Providence, Rhode Island, Temple Bethel. And not far from here, his son, my father, was born on Blackstone Boulevard in 1924. So I have some connections to the city. There were no pogroms where I grew up in Canton, Ohio. That's not a surprise. But neither were we wholly accepted. And what I want to do this evening is kind of construct an arc about what I experienced in the realm of diversity before there was a term diversity, really. And then what I saw in the newsroom, and then finally what I see today when we talk about diversity. So let me just describe for you just a little bit about life in Canton, Ohio. We could not live in various sections of the city as Jews because the contracts of sale for the houses forbid the sale of those properties to Jews and, quote, coloreds, the undesirables in the community. So, for example, there was a lake we really wanted to live beside, but we couldn't because of our faith. We couldn't belong to a country club there, uh, not that we could afford to, but if we could have, we still couldn't have belonged because it was restricted against Jews. We couldn't have belonged to the city club. And then there were the whispers, the accusations by classmates of Jews killing Christ. Um, there was, at that time, a bestseller written called A Gentleman's Agreement about how it was totally socially acceptable to discriminate against Jews. Our town was not a melting pot in any traditional sense. It was more like a barrel of crabs. They came from Eastern Europe, Slavic, as well as German, Irish, Italian, Greek. They were drawn by factory jobs in the steel mills and by the nearby coal fields. I remember a guy lived next to us, Scott Rettman, who went to De Bowden College. And I remember his mother, when she rolled up her sleeves, had a, a number tattooed on her forearm. So the history was not remote geographically, and it wasn't remote in terms of time. A lot of us were bigoted. And when I say us, I don't just mean me, my family, Canton. I mean America. A lot of us were bigoted. I remember the first time that I used the word queer. Uh, I meant it in the term odd. I was probably in the fifth or sixth grade. And my mother said, don't ever use that word again. And I said, why not? And she said, it's the worst thing that can happen to you. And perhaps in the late 1950s in Canton, Ohio, she was right. Uh, in that period, in the 1950s, I had a second cousin who was sitting in a bar 
and a gay gentleman walked in. And my second cousin insulted him and roughed him up. And the gentleman returned with a gun and shot him dead. One of my best friends when I grew up in Canton was a guy named Scott Chandler. I spent a lot of time with him as a child in elementary school. And uh, when I got to college, his mother asked me to look in on him. She was worried about him. And before I had a chance to do that, a short time later, he had taken his own life. Um, so what my mother said, in a sense, given the, the pressures in that community, uh, she wasn't completely wrong. Uh, we had someone who worked in the house named Bitey. She was African-American. Her real name was Willa Mae Bryant. She was black, and her face was discolored from scarlet fever that she had when she was a girl. And she was of profound influence uh, in terms of my growing up, my values, my vision of the world. And she would tell me stories about her growing up, how her mother did the laundry for the brothels, and the pimps would dance on the, on the breakfast table. We had in Canton more brothels than churches. I think even Time Magazine noted that. We were quite a town. Um, and um, so Bidey taught me how to play the numbers. Even when I was in high school, I was playing the numbers. She taught me how to gamble illegally. Um, when I was in the third grade, we had to make a project out of clay. And what I did was shape a kneeling figure in black. And it was fired in the kiln, and I gave it to her and it was one of her most precious objects. And in the years and decades after that, I traveled all over the world for work, and wherever I was on her birthday, I sent her a dozen long-stemmed red roses with a telegram expressing my love for her. And the day that she died, I was working on a story at the Washington Post, and I left it for someone else and flew home to be at the funeral and stand by the graveside with her, with her son, and I was about to say her other son. Um, so I'm almost done with, with my growing up, but I just want to frame this because it was America back then. It's not the America that, that, that you all, I suspect, are familiar with. I went to a, a boarding school in Ohio in a small town called Hudson. In that town, if you were black, you couldn't get your hair cut. No barber would, would cut your hair. This is north. This is not, I'm not talking about Alabama or Georgia. Um, when we read The Merchant of Venice, for the next couple of years, I was known to some of my classmates as Shylock. I couldn't shake it. Some of them didn't extend that nicety to me. They called me Kike. There were a few occasions where their animosities showed themselves physically. Um, I had a teacher once tell me to go back to my room and change my boots. I had boots on, and I explained to him it was the only one's shoes I had, and he said, come on, you're Jewish. In college, I attended Brandeis University, and um, at that point, it was about half Jewish. But even there, there were fault lines in American society. This is where Angela Davis went, Herbert Marcuse taught, and black students, when I went there in the late 60s, were very militant. And one of the things that I remember is that all the black males lived on one floor in one of the buildings, one of the, the, the campus dorms. And there was one room that was open, and no one wanted it, and so I took it. And I want to tell you that things went smoothly, but they didn't. It was very rough. It was very rough. Um, in 1970, one of my summer jobs, uh, I worked in Virginia on the road crew of Virginia Gas, Light, and Electric. I worked at Jack Hammer dug ditches, poured tar. I was the only white on the road crew, probably the only white that had ever been on the road crew. And I'd been advised not to take the job before I took it, but I wanted to take it. All of the supervisors were white, and when the day was over and we were all sweaty, the whites, the supervisors would not let me shower in their showers or dress change in their lockers because it was segregated. So I dressed with and, and showered with my black colleagues. and. Uh, they used to joke with me because I was so dark-skinned from being in the sun that the only part of me that was white was my ass. Um, but, um, you know, they had names like Magellan Wiggins and Deacon Jones, and they were wonderful people. Wonderful, wonderful people. So let me flash forward today and say a word about my family. 
and then I'll move on. I said that the 23 and me, that I was 99% European Jew and everyone in my family was married to, to a Jew and, and et cetera, et cetera. So how about today? Two first cousins converted to Pentecostalism and for years one of them pastored to an all black church in Youngstown, Ohio. He married an African American woman, they had three children. Another first cousin married a close relative of George Wallace who was a segregationist and governor of Alabama. She was not Jewish. Their daughter was just ordained an Episcopalian minister graduating from Princeton University uh, Seminary. Another first cousin, a woman, is gay. She and her partner just adopted a daughter from Russia. My own twice widowed mother on her second marriage married out of faith. My twice divorced sister twice married out of faith. As for my nuclear family, I alone married within the faith, but we have our own measure of diversity, having adopted two sons from South Korea. And you remember that boarding school that I told you about, where I was a pariah? Today, more than a third of the school is made up of minorities. Years after I graduated, the school invited me back for a week of lecturing. I was a distinguished fellow there and alum. And while I was there, I asked to see my student file. I was curious to see if they still had it. And they pulled it out from 1964 when I was a freshman. There it was in the headmaster's office, and they handed it to me. And on the front of the file was a blue Star of David indicating I was Jewish. And next to the Star of David was a note. And it said, isn't this the sort of thing local fathers should have warned us about? In other words, they didn't know I was Jewish because of my last name. They accepted me by accident. And they were reprimanding someone in admissions for not doing more homework so that they could have spotted me. So, and they later invited me, and I accepted, to go on the board of the school. Funny how things change in the course of time. Can you imagine what my family's 23 and me will look like in a century? or what America's 23andMe will look like in a century compared to that which I grew up with. Now, let me share with you some, some memories of work okay, in the newsroom. What I remember, one of my early memories, was from 1974, a newsroom in Ohio, in Akron, the laughter at the feminist movement. These were men who delighted in joking about bra burners, delegitimizing them. The only women that worked there covered fashion, parties, and religion. That pattern was repeated across the United States. Leering, off-color remarks, inappropriate jokes were as accepted a part of the day as hot-type pneumatic tubes and paper boys. It was just part of the culture. But that culture's days were numbered. In 1974, when I entered the field, the nation's most eminent and gutsy publisher was a woman, Kay Graham of the Washington Post. And the Republic will forever be in her debt, guiding the paper and the nation through the Pentagon Papers and the Watergate scandal. I had the privilege on a couple of occasions to have lunch with her in a private dining room with a couple of other uh, editors and reporters. Um, and when I was a Fulbright Scholar in China, I arranged for her to come and meet my students in China, and that was a, a great joy and a great pleasure. Um, but Donald Trump was not the first misogynist and not the first one to resent women with power. In my generation, the Watergate generation and thereafter, we will always remember the words of the Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, during an interview with reporter Bob Woodward, who became my boss, when he was questioned about Watergate, he said, tell Kay Graham, quote, she's going to get her tit caught in a big fat ringer if that's published, close quote. Once again, Trump is not the only one who could be either misogynistic or foul-mouthed. To which Ben Bradley, the paper's legendary editor, responded, cut the words her tit and print it, which is exactly what they did. Anyone who still imagined women only belonged in the party and fashion sections of the press 
got a pretty good lesson that day. Kay Graham helped usher in a vision of women journalists, but also women in positions of authority. She was the first head of a Fortune 500 company in the United States when she became CEO in 1972. And it was one hell of a time to head that company, let me assure you. The Post newsroom in the mid and late 70s was a place where women could and did do anything. A friend of mine in 1980 named Loretta Tafani did a story that was the hardest story I could ever imagine. Dangerous, difficult, it was about rape in the county jail. Won the Pulitzer Prize and it provoked reform of, of designs of prisons and jails across the United States. I think of Carol Murphy, a foreign correspondent who was caught behind enemy lines when Iraq invaded Kuwait and who reported there incredibly courageously winning herself the Pulitzer Prize in 1991. <coughs> Diversity was not a topic of the newsroom in those days. Women did not enjoy equal pay or full respect. That would come later. But it was clear to one and all that the old mold has gone forever. Uh, and I just mentioned <coughs> the former student of mine, Mary Jordan, daughter of Irish immigrants. Her father was a pipe fitter, her mother was a maid in Cleveland. She reported for more than 40 countries for the Washington Post. In 2003, she won a Pulitzer as a foreign correspondent. So these are some of the things that I witnessed in the newsroom. Let me talk about gays for a minute in the newsroom. There were still lingering homophobia in the newsroom when I was there at the Washington Post and Time Magazine. There were what we called limp wrist jokes, which were totally fine. No one would, would, would chastise you for that. Um, but it was starting, it was starting to raise eyebrows. People were, there was a sense that this just wasn't quite acceptable. There was one notable exception, and I'm, I'm gonna rush through this, but there was one guy who was a homophobe, a true homophobe, and he did great damage because he was very powerful. He was a very senior editor, and I'm not gonna mention his name because he's since passed away, but I'll give you a couple of examples of what he did that I personally witnessed. There was a guy that I knew, a friend of mine, African-American and gay, reporter, very distinguished, and this guy, this editor, routinely hounded and harassed him, asking him when he was gonna get married. It was relentless, and he finally couldn't take it anymore, and he left and joined the New York Times. Um, there was this, uh, this, this editor was a bird watcher, and he noticed that there were gays that were meeting in a bird sanctuary that he attended, and that infuriated him. And so he assigned a reporter to write about it so that authorities would come in there and flush them out. The story appeared and they were driven out. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the worst, just personally, I did a series, I worked for a year on a, a series, an investigative series about the Smithsonian Institution. Um, it ended up being a five-part series. It won a number of prizes. It was well-received. But when this editor read it, he, he took me out to lunch right before it came out, and he said, I want you to get that goddamn fag, Dylan Ripley, who is the head, the secretary of the Smithsonian. And I was just speechless. I'd never heard, I'd never heard an editor talk that way. I'd never, you know, and, and, uh, and then when my series came out, he came over, he, he threw it on, on my desk, and he said, I thought you were gonna get that fag. I was so upset that I went to Bradley and said I was thinking of resigning. I was, and, and, and Ben put his arm around me, offered me a ride home, and let me know that this guy did not represent the views of the Washington Post or the newsroom. Uh, one last thing that I'll mention apropos of this is when Reagan was running for office, a Republican senator came to Ben Bradley's house in the middle of the night, really upset, because he had been in a car with a senior uh, person in the Reagan campaign. The senator was Republican. And this person had put his hand on the senator's hip and made a sexual ad advance towards it. And he was so upset that he went to Ben Bradley's house in the middle of the night to tell him this. 
and he wrote a memo to Ben and kept another one in his, in his Senate office. And, you know, so Ben had me and another reporter investigate gays in the Reagan administration. This is before they'd won, before the election played out. And the other reporter and I accepted the assignment with one caveat, that no one would see our notes, no story would be written, unless there was some evidence that something wrong had occurred. And that did not mean that there were gays surrounding Reagan. There had been gays around every presidential candidate probably since George Washington. So we went out, we did the story, we found, yeah, surprise, surprise, there were a lot of gays around Reagan, big deal. No one saw our notes, they were destroyed, that was the end of the story. Um, but in this meeting, this editor that I told you about that was a homophobe, he said something about those queers, and Ben said, shut up, I don't ever want to hear you say that word in here again. I thought that was, that was pretty courageous, because Ben was a World War II vet, and in those days, you know, it sounds cool today, but back then, it took a little bit of gumption to stand your ground that way, and he did, and, and I respected him for it. Um, okay, I'm just going to offer a couple of other ones. And um, the, the Washington Post on the issue of race and diversity was, it was progressive, it was activist, it was deeply concerned and deeply motivated. And that, in a very curious way, was a prescription for disaster. And I'm going to describe why I say that. Everyone that I knew in the newsroom wanted more blacks in the newsroom. So one of the women that was hired, an African-American woman named Janet Cook, was sort of the poster child of what we wanted. Graduate of Vassar, fluent in Portuguese, elegant writer, um, a bon vivant, we all liked her. I got to know her pretty well, I was dating her roommate. And um, she wrote a story about an eight-year-old heroin addict named Jimmy, which appeared on the front page, and galvanized the entire city. But she didn't name Jimmy's last name, and there was a lot of suspicion about who Jimmy was, and the city and the police demanded to know so that they could rush in and save him, and she refused to disclose it, and to make a long story short, Jimmy didn't exist. And the story had to be rescinded, and, the, and that story had won a Pulitzer Prize. And it had to be returned, and Janet was fired. And as something very similar happened with Jason Blair at the New York Times a few years later. An African-American journalist, very promising, very smart. I actually knew him, too. I knew him as a student. I liked him. If he had asked me for a letter of recommendation, I would have written it for him. But he did much the same thing at the Times, and he was fired. And, 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 and I bring it up for this reason, because both institutions really wanted to promote diversity, but they went about it the wrong way, because they thought that they had to lower standards or compromise standards in order to promote diversity. And the black journalists that I knew were completely insulted by this. I mean, people like the city editor of the Washington Post, Milton Coleman, a friend of mine named Bill Raspberry, who won a Pulitzer, a columnist, uh, a dear friend of mine named Neil Henry, graduate of Princeton, who studied with John Hersey. They didn't need anybody to compromise the standards. They were great journalists. But the Post and the Times and other institutions in America, I think, thought that maybe they could take shortcuts to address historical injustices and bring the numbers up. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't work that way. Um, I just want to flag uh, the issue of Asian Americans very briefly, and then I want to get into some random thoughts about diversity. Um, <coughs> uh, I should say also that as a journalist, I tried to use my skills to address issues of civil rights, racial inequity. I, I, one of the stories I'm most proud of is I got a guy named Maurice Williams out of jail who was in for a, a string of 21 armed robberies in St. Louis. I proved he didn't do it, the African-American, proved he didn't do it. And what made the story most unusual is I proved who did. And so my guy got out, one on the Today Show that morning, and the guy that I fingered as, as having been the perpetrator of those armed robberies was placed in prison. Um, that was unusual. My, one of my first stories at the Washington Post was exposing a skating rink where they would not allow black children in Fauquier County 
a rural county outside of Washington, D.C., to skate there. And after the story came out, the Justice Department launched an investigation. I mean, we all did stories like this. You know, it's part of the joy of being a journalist is that, is that you could be an agent of change. You could do things about it. And, and uh, what I did was not unusual. We all did it. Um, but to Asian Americans, um, when I left the post, I went to Time Magazine. And within a week after I was there, I knew it was a mistake. <laughs> it just wasn't, it wasn't my kind of culture. <coughs> it was very patrician. They didn't like to roll their sleeves up and do the hard work of reporting that I was used to at the Post. And I was an editor in the Nation section first before I went down to Washington as their investigative reporter. And I caught wind of a story they were working on about Asian Americans. There was to be a cover story. And the cut line, the title, on the front of the magazine was to be Asian Whiz Kids. Okay? Now, that may sound bizarre to you in 2016, but back then it passed the straight face test. And I wrote a letter to the executive editor of Time Magazine. I said, this is stereotyping. This is, this is racist, you know? You are creating, you are you are augmenting uh, a myth and a stereotype that is going to discredit this magazine and, and, and do real damage to our communities. And he laughed at me and he said, you don't understand. This isn't stereotyping, I'm saying something positive about them. You know, that was his reasoning, something positive about them. I protested once more. I was ignored. The magazine came out, and boy, did it hit the fan. I mean, and let me tell you, I took great perverse delight in the fact that it hit the fan, and never again did they go down that route. Uh, I later wrote a piece for Newsweek magazine about how one of my two sons was most certainly not a whiz kid, um, uh, both adopted from, from South Korea. Uh, um, but. You know, these kinds of stereotypes were pervasive. I remember when my second son arrived from South Korea, he was five months old, five and a half months old. I walked into a convenience store with him, and there was a merchant behind the, 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 the register who was, who was Korean, a Korean merchant. And he saw me holding my son, who was five and a half months old, and he said to me, he's going to be great in math. And I thought, what? You know? The depths of absurdity, but you know these things were pervasive, and they take time to, to unpeel. So let me just um, go to chapter three, which is some random thoughts about diversity. Uh, I'm not crazy about the word, um, <coughs> to put it mildly. Um, there's a difference between diversity and tolerance, and I want to I want to address this. The America that I grew up in had a fair degree of intolerance. And the arc that I described to some degree moved from intolerance to tolerance. But tolerance is not an end point in pursuit of diversity. Tolerance comes from a Latin word. You know, the, it was mentioned earlier, I was a classics major. And the, and the meaning of it, the verb meaning of it is, the ability to endure or bear pain. That's what it means, tolerate, to, to endure pain, okay? And the idea is that when you're with someone who's different, they are a source of anguish to you, but in your somehow enlightened state, you can put up with it and endure their presence. Well, it's not a very sophisticated, accommodating, or welcoming view of, quote, the other, okay? So tolerance, in my view, is, is better than intolerance, but it's a far cry from, from, from what I think we, we would want or envision in our institutions, in our government um, today. Um, <coughs> diversity has, has an interesting root, as does university. They share a root in common. In some ways, they're not opposite, but, they, but they, they sound different themes, and the difference in the theme is revealing. They both have the vertebrae to turn in them, but diversitas, or divertebrae, both have to do with this notion of 
turning away of, of, of diverse, of varied. But university, which also has that vertebrated turn, has the prefix uni, which suggests a kind of unity. And in the 14th century, when this started to, to come into place, the origin of the word suggests the drawing together of various guilds and student bodies and scholarly societies. So you have on the one hand diversity, which suggests this kind of diverse fabric, and on the other hand university, which suggests some concentration or unification. Um, so, um, what does diversity mean? I, I, I honestly, I'm at a bit of a loss um, <coughs> because it's been conflated with so many things. On the one hand, I hear people use it to suggest a kind of mirror of society, that, that it reflects the diversity in society at large. Um, I think so in, in a, not in a mocking way, but I think of Noah's Ark, you know, bringing on two by twos. Uh, but, you know, what do we mean by that? It doesn't reflect society in any way. Institutions like this, which pride themselves on diversity, are in no way reflective of the general community. You know, not numerically or in any other way. You're not going out and trying to get representative America to come to Brown, okay? You're looking for the best, the brightest, the most talented, the most natural leaders from each group and each segment to come to Brown. What you're doing is skimming the elite off of various groups, which is not representative. You don't want the slow, you don't want the uninspiring, you don't want the dull. You don't want a reflection of America. And you pride yourself on the fact that you turn away 90% plus of Americans who want to come here. From that, you draw a certain degree of prestige and credibility. Harvard and Stanford are worse. They're vying over who can get lower than 5% quickest and deeper. Okay? And, and so this notion that it's a mirror of society I think is, is, um, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, then there's the notion of, of, you know, why do we want diversity? And, and, and for some, it, it, when I hear them talking about it, it's like eating your Brussels sprouts, that it's good for you, but it's distasteful, you know? Um, I just think that's all wrong. I think that kind of harkens back to this notion of, of tolerance. Um, so. <coughs> And, and, you know, I think about um, the linkage between groups that, that are courted to represent diversity. And, and this, is, this is disturbing, and it's, it's very thin ice under my feet when I go here. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to give you a trigger warning. I'm going to give me a trigger warning um, that I'm on thin ice here. But one of the things that really bothers me when we talk about um, you know, the, the whole notion of race, is, of racialism has been discredited, and yet we still talk of, in a kind of taxonomy, the, these groupings that we, that we court, you know, we want more blacks, we want more Asian Americans, we want more this, we want more that. And why do we want them, you know? What is it that they bring to the table? And one of the things that disturbs me is this notion that somehow by identifying the group, we're identifying a viewpoint, which is really, to me, destructive of the whole goal of, of diversity as I understand it. To me, it's, it's, it's elevating the supremacy of individualism. You know? It's, it's not allowing them to be lost in the muck of identity politics and groups. And so, you know, I, I get disturbed about this because, you know, in, in, in so-called uh, cultural competency and diversity training, if a teacher is talking about African Americans or Asian Americans or Jews, we're trained, if you're talking about Asian Americans, you don't look at an Asian American in your class. If you're talking about blacks, you don't look at a black in your class because it puts them in an awkward position as if they're a representative. It's like the UN and they represent a country. But at the same time, on a more subtle level, there is this kind of conflation, but for me, from what I hear and what I see, 
between group identity and, and viewpoint. And I, 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 I haven't, in my own mind, <coughs> come to terms with what, that, what the resolution of that is. Um, I worry deeply, and I'm, I'm going to end in just a minute because I don't want to go too long here. I worry deeply about the collision between social engineering and, and the liberal tradition, the great liberal tradition. I worry about safe zones, triggers, microaggressions, and the kind of John Stuart Mill vision of an institution as being a bastion of free speech and free thought. And to me, there is nothing that puts in jeopardy quicker um, the appreciation of the other than the suppression of speech and ideas. Um, and I see that in this country, and I see it in Britain. When I, I was in Britain uh, last semester in the UK um, last year, and when I, when I left the country the day I left, the headline on the Telegraph, the decent British newspaper, was free speech threatened. And it was about what was happening at Oxford uh, in the context of, of, of safe zones and speech that was not being permitted and speakers that were being disinvited. It was a kind of mirror image of, of, of what we've seen here. Um, for me, the value of diversity, the beauty of diversity, diversity is not, for me, something that is a rectifier of past wrongs. It is something you pursue to enhance the environment of the community you're in. It is not a sacrifice, it's an advantage, it's a boon. It is not something that you endure or suffer, it's something you seek out because it enriches the experience of everyone that's there. You know, And that in an institution like a university or a college or a social entity or a government we all benefit, we all profit from the broadest exposure to ideas and experiences. Now, if that's the standard, it has very little to do with race. I'm not sure it even has that much to do with gender. You know, I mean, for me, what I think about is how people see the world and how they think about the world. That, to me, is the source of diversity. Now, if you grow up in the hood or you grow up in Appalachia as a poor white, um, you know, certainly where you grow up will have an influence. But it, it's not a defining influence. It doesn't say that I know how you think because of your phenotype or your genetics. That bothers me that, that in some circumstances um, that's the case. Uh, and, 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 and I'm just going to I'm about to close, so, uh, and this is coming from left field, or actually from right field. One of the things that really bothers me is the orthodoxy that diversity has spawned, the political orthodoxy, um, the exclusion of conservative thought. That really bothers me. I wrote, I wrote essays for Chronicle of Higher Education and many other places about how institutions, particularly liberal institutions, should have a kind of affirmative action to recruit conservative professors and conservative students. And I got blasted. I got blasted. You know? and, and to me, if you're really serious about diversity, that's a part of it. And by the way, folks, 24% of America self-identifies as liberals. 38% is conservative, the rest is moderate. So unless you're very careful about where you live, your neighbors are gonna be conservative. And if you demonize them, or lack the capacity to speak to them, then all you're doing is adding to the great schism that is America today. And I would argue that the rise of Trumpism is in part a reflection of the kind of closed-mindedness the alienation, the disenfranchisement, the marginalization of people that think differently than we do, which is completely contrary to my perception of diversity. I am a, a lover of John Stuart Mill and Bertrand Russell and, and other liberals who believed 
that you exposed yourself to contrary ideas because only one of two things can happen. Either in that exposure you will discover that you were wrong and you can correct your ideas or you will discover that you were right and it will reaffirm the rectitude of your position. But you can't lose in that exposure, you know? So, um, I'm going to conclude in one second here. Um, you know, I, this diversity in some ways, if it's not handled correctly and if it's done in a kind of automatic way, can produce some very silly results. There's someone I know attended a, a very good university. That university courted a young man from Kenya, assuming that that young man could add to diversity. And in that young man's essay to the college, he wrote about hunting in Kenya with bow and arrow. And much of what he wrote was so unique and exotic to the American experience that I could just imagine the admissions people salivating at the prospect of getting this young man. But when he arrived on the campus, it turns out he was white, okay? He didn't speak, he spoke Swahili, but he was white. He was the son of, of, of British colonials. And I think they were disappointed. But the question is, did he bring less diversity to the campus because of the color of his skin? When my boys were young, they went to a magnet school in Washington, D.C. And the bureaucrats that ran the school, this is a public school, they had a box to check for Asian Americans, and there were damn few Asian Americans in that school. It was a school, a magnet school, that focused on Spanish. We didn't really want our sons going to a school focusing on Spanish. They were mixed up enough. They'd just arrived from South Korea. They were Jewish. They were already feeling a bit like the other. Did they really need to learn all their courses in Spanish? And so I appealed to the school and said, can they transfer out to a school where most of the courses are taught in English? like most schools. And my request was denied. And it was denied on this basis, that the school needed the diversity of my two sons. Well, what diversity? They came over at five months. They didn't speak Korean. They had no recollections of Korea. They could tell you all about the Washington Redskins. They could tell you about where to get the best Chesapeake Bay crabs, but they couldn't tell you anything about Korea. How did they add to our appreciation of foreign cultures? They didn't. And it wasn't until I wrote a piece in the Washington Post about this that they were embarrassed and relented and allowed my boys to do what which was best for them, and they had to uncheck the box that the bureaucrats had set up to show that they had Asian Americans in the school. That, to me, is a preposterous definition of diversity. Okay. Um, <coughs> today, Penn, P-E-N. Any writers in the room think know what that is? It's a major respected organization of writers, a national organization. They came out with a study today. I think it was 120 pages. And what they focused on, the, the point of the study was, quote, a rising generation alienated from core American values of free speech. And the report speaks to concerns of how to, quote, advance inclusion and equality while safeguarding intellectual and academic freedom. That was today. I'm not alone in my concerns here, okay? That I know. Um, so, okay, conclusion. My first chapter, my life, looked at sort of intolerance to tolerance. The second one, tolerance to diversity to some degree. The third was just some random reflections on it. And the fourth chapter is yet to be written. That's the one that you all are going to write. Um, I hope to catch a glimpse of it before I go. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it, I, what I've tried to express, and I think I have done it nobly, is the depth of my confusion on this issue and the depth of contradiction and, and conflict within myself over this. So that's it. I thank you very much, and, I, and, and I'm hoping now to hear from you, which will introduce an element of diversity into the discussion. Please.
please. So I think that's a very good point, and that's an inconsistency. Someone famous once said that, that contradiction is not a sign of falsehood and lack of contradiction not a sign of truth. Um, and, and I, that's a contradiction, it, it is a contradiction. Um, I'm damn close to a free speech absolutist. Um, I, I believe, uh, and I'll say this, and this will not uh, win over any hearts in here, uh, in my class, I tell my students, first day, you can say anything you want. Anything. I mean, if a student wanted to call me a kike, if they wanted to say the N-word, anything. In my class, they're welcome to say it. Now, I'm not going to protect them. I'm not going to defend them. They're going to have to own it and pay the price, and it may be the supreme price. But I am not going to inhibit speech in my class. That's, that's a pretty extreme position. Um, but in my life, dealing with the prejudice that I dealt with, I always, I wanted to know who were my enemies, and if they were my enemies, I wanted to see if I could win them over. If I couldn't, at least I could identify them. There was a fellow in Cleveland, Ohio, who had a large convenience store in the ghetto, in the hood. He was Palestinian. He hated Jews. Um, he'd come over uh, from the West Bank, and the wall of his building had swastikas, the word kike, and all kinds, and, and, and images of Jews as monkeys. And, and he was known as, as being virulently anti-Semitic. <clears throat> and I called him up one day, and I said, you want to have lunch? I'm Jewish. And we went out, I went out to his place, we had lunch, we spent the afternoon together. I wrote about him for the Washington Post. And what I learned was he wasn't anti-Semitic at all. He was anti-Israeli soldier. One of his, his classmates when he was a kid was killed by a rubber bullet. You know, it wasn't anti-Semitism. Seeing what, what was there could have been the end. It could have been, uh, that would have blocked the opportunity for dialogue for most people. But for me, it was an invitation. And I, I've always viewed even the most toxic speech as an invitation. I'm actually not. No, no, I, 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 no, that far I won't go. The, like on the, on the, on the Asian whiz kids stuff. Yeah, or the, you know, or the what Ben did, I would defend that editor's right to say queer or fag to the end of time. I would also defend Ben's right to speak his mind to the end of time. I mean, just because someone criticizes you for your speech doesn't mean you can't say it. And I think we have a responsibility to voice our views to sensitize others to the implications and, and the costs of what they say. That's a whole lot different than saying you can't say it. You know, if that senior editor persisted, I would have defended his right to the end to do so. You know? So I, I, I think there's more consistency than you might give me credit for. But I do have a responsibility to tell someone, if they're hurting others in what they say, that that's my perception and let them come back at me with their perception. Um, as a follow-up point to that, how do you conceive of power relations? Because in your example, so, so on the one hand, you had you know, this 
this authority figure above the editor who kind of was able to shoot him down, basically. Yet on the issue of the Wiz Kid um, uh, article, right. that person was above you and was able By to far. shoot you down. And so like the concern, I think, or my, my kind of thoughts on this is, you know, freedom of speech um, on the political front is formulated so that the, the, the mass, the populace, can speak against authority. But when authority is able to suppress that freedom of speech, you know, that's, that's problematic. And so I, I think of it, of the political sense, as it plays out in the social. And I think you're, I, I see you kind of focusing down on, on the social without taking this power dynamic. I, I think that's very interesting. I mean, a lot of exchanges are, are, are hierarchical. And the question is, are you going to surrender your citizenship rights and responsibilities because of, of hierarchy? I mean, there's been no great equalizer like social media. And, and I believe the power of ideas can dramatically affect and even override some very strict and rigid hierarchies, because I've seen that happen. You can change minds of people above you if you offer cogent <laughs> arguments. I mean, not always. And there and are people that will abuse their power, of course, because that's just the nature of, of power. But, but I'm not going to, for one moment, surrender my responsibilities to speak my mind on things that I feel are important just because someone's in a position way above me. I don't think that's her point. I think her point is like, this is not a level playing field, yet you're acting like it is. Well, it's not a lever, loving, level playing field in what sense? exist anymore, but it, it, it bears no resemblance to what it was. And, and it's in large part because of the groundswell of social media and all the alternative avenues for expression. I mean, the democratization of expression in this country is, is revolutionary. So the model that you're describing, the remnants still exist, but they don't call the shots the way they did. Look at them. What about them? Yeah, well, how did that all right, so, so look at Donald Trump. If you look at a list of the presidential endorsements by all the major news organizations, there are almost none that have endorsed him. And yet he has a very strong base and a very loud voice in, in the community. Now, I might lament that, but the point is that notwithstanding the array of major legacy media that stand against him, He's being heard quite well. I mean, I think that runs contrary to your... I'm, I'm actually just thinking about the way that Hillary Clinton won and boys were used to just two, right? I'm but sorry, you're... Uh, well, no, go ahead. No, that's okay. Go ahead. I, I, I mean, I don't want to... I mean, All right, but, but, but finish this, because just this one thought, because I'd like to know. The question is that it's, it's sort of like our political sort of like choices have been narrowed, right? So, and that is true. People love Trump for a variety of reasons that have to do with right populism and what have you, right? But the choices are so narrow. And if you think of, like, for example, what happened to Bernie Sanders, right? Like, why did, you know, the, uh, oh, you know, or what they're doing to Jill Stein in the mainstream media, right? She doesn't get a time of the day. Um, Gary Johnson, of course, is a joke to everybody as well, too. I agree with that a little bit, but still, right? Um, that you see the sort of very narrowing of the public discourse that is still dominated by and, all right, so, I, I, and, all right, so let me just respond briefly to that, and it will be completely unsatisfying to you. But it's, it's one of the, uh, uh, the, sh the, you know, it's very hard, the chicken and the egg, it's very hard for me to differentiate between the influence of the media and the media reflecting the citizenry. The, 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 the narrowing of that spectrum, I think, is not purely a product of media or legacy media, I think to a not insignificant degree, it's a reflection of a country whose political imagination is relatively narrow and has been forever. 
Mm-hmm. Well. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, anyhow. Okay. Sorry. Please. Oh, I just had a question. Um, you know, just thinking about like the people who are in newsrooms themselves and right. kind of thinking about, you know, how people even get into the field of journalism. Like as someone who's coming from like rural Washington State, you know, didn't really grow up with media and, and someone who's trying to pursue the field, like I've definitely seen, you know, just, you know, my background, um, how that's kind of created barriers to pursuing this field and also, I mean, the abundance of unpaid internships um, and things like that. Um, so I'm just curious if you could speak a little bit to that um, in newsrooms today, because I think even though, you know, in my experience, even though there's not as um, overt of like discriminatory things being said, I still think that we don't have a very, um, as far as views on the world or backgrounds, like newsrooms are still pretty white. A lot of people from, you know, elite spaces like Brown, um, Growing a lot of people, I'm guessing, are also from cities and, and things like that. So, I mean, is that something, like, how do you think that that can be addressed? Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think that opportunities are not evenly distributed, never have been and aren't now, but are perhaps more so now than they were. <clears throat> you know, in, in another class, um, my students are about to read a, a story by a guy named Eli Sanders called The Bravest Woman in Seattle. Now, that did not appear in the Washington Post of the New York Times. It appeared in thestranger.com. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Washington. Okay. That's, that's, not, that's not a major legacy media outlet, but it won the Pulitzer Prize. And Eli, who is gay and who wrote about a gay couple and, and the rape, that story 30, 40 years ago or 20 years ago would not have found its way into any press, much less win a Pulitzer Prize. Eli's background is not um, you know, to my knowledge, I don't think it's anything akin to the kind of Columbia journalism kind of education. Um, and there are a lot of people like that. The, the, there are a lot of side entrances to journalism these days. And there's a lot of great journalism that's going on, not in the traditional legacy forums. So I think, uh, and I applaud the fact that, you know, the gatekeepers, yeah, they're still there. But there are a whole lot of other side gates that didn't exist before that have diminished their status and increased the access to stories that would never have seen the light of day. That's, that's my view. Do you think that, um, you know, I'm just like, I've been thinking about this question a lot. Yeah. Um, and I'm also interested in education, so I'm thinking a lot about like youth, like media education and things like that, like, you know, giving young people in public schools who might not really be familiar with media or like, you know, didn't have like a college, a high school paper and things like that, you know, it, being able to engage with that kind of um, material. And like, I'm curious if you think like, is that something that maybe um, the legacy media outlets should be in, investing in and, and being involved with, you know, like rather than, you know, a few people, you know, who have different backgrounds kind of being able to break through and, and enter these institutions or do you think that Maybe there's a way that you know mainstream media outlets could be incentivized to be you know being engaged in youth media education or maybe offering scholarships to students um, to do unpaid internships and things like that. Well, first of all, I hate unpaid internships. I think they're a nightmare, and 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 I think it's just uh, I'll put on my 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 socialist hat here. I mean, I think it's just incredibly raw exploitation of people, you know, taking advantage of them. You know, and, and, and the laws in most of the states, the way these work is you get academic credit and that, that way they don't have to pay you. And so, you know, the schools coll- collude with the institutions. They, 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 they grant a credit or two so the institutions don't have to pay them. If the, if the institutions didn't give them credit, the, 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 the media would have to pay them. You know, so it, it kind of works on both sides. And, and I think it's unconscionable. You know, when I was an intern, I got paid. And that's the way it should be. You're doing honest work, you know. You're so. I, but as far as the you know education media and, and the mainstream or legacy media, this country is now a jillion different experiments ongoing in these areas. I, I, you know, I, I lament what I see as certainly the diminution, if not the demise, of the really big news organizations, but I applaud 
all the opportunities and experiments that are going on in this country. I mean, it's phenomenal. You know, I mean, I have I have students that go out that that you know that have very little experience, and they'll ally themselves with some investigative website in Lexington, Kentucky, and break major stories. You know that that couldn't have happened before. You know, and they'll bring in students from the local schools to help them. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff going on that that is frankly, I think, <coughs> very very promising. Um, a lot of experimentation. It's, this is, right now it's just a model of disruption. We don't know how it's going to end. It hasn't been played out. The legacy media has no economic model for survival right now. It doesn't mean they won't survive. It's just that they, they're in this transitional period. They haven't figured out because they lost their advertising. It's all migrated away. And, and the advertising they get online is so niche and so low compared to the high advertising rates they got before with general circulation. You know, th these things are... They're, they haven't shaken out yet, but you know there's scarcely a city in this country now that doesn't have a number of really robust websites doing serious reporting. Um, so I'm actually quite sanguine about about that. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the recent, one of the more recent challenges that journalists have complained of facing, which is that you have to tailor your article that it gets the most or likes on Facebook and sacrifice content for headlines. Yeah, so the, a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, I went into the Washington Post newsroom, which is kind of like going home for me. Now, they're not there anymore. They've moved buildings since, and that building's been torn down. Well, this is maybe four years ago. I walked in, and I was talking to a buddy, and I looked down at a desk, and I see this form I've never seen before. And it was a CEO, an SEO form, you know, which, which is search engine optimization. And, and what this form was, was, and it was required of all reporters, was to fill it out on each story on how they could enhance the algorithms that would draw attention to their story. You know? To me, that's called marketing. <clears throat> and I don't like marketing in the context of news reporting. But I am a dinosaur. And if they're to survive, they're going to have to acknowledge that SEOs matter. I don't like it, and I sure as hell that's hope that stories don't get crafted specifically to, to, uh, to fuel algorithms. I think that would be terrible. But, you know, I would be deluding myself into thinking that every newsroom in the country isn't fiercely aware of these issues. You know, so it's, you know, you put your finger on a serious problem, um, was th there was somebody else that? Yeah. Maybe we could take one more question. Please. Two? Okay. Well, yeah. I just have a question. Um, to let you speak a little bit more about your own personal experience, uh, not in the context of, of any debates that have been going on here. You mentioned that you spent time in China. I'm curious um, when and where you were and how that informed your understanding of diversity, if at all. Because obviously they have a very different. Um, understanding both of uh, freedom of press and speech and also of racial and right. diversity. So I was there before you were born. So everything I tell you is antediluvian. I was there first in 85, 86, and then I went back for Tiananmen in 89. It's a long time ago. Okay? And, you know, when I was there, and, and I'm quoting things that, that, that were recited to me back then, the Han population was like 97% with 3% minority. In other words, a very homogeneous society, right? So in terms of diversity, and the, and the minorities were oppressed, whether it was Tibet or Uyghurs or, you know, the Muslims in the West, whatever it was, not a pretty picture. I'm, I've not been a fan of, of the party, you know, and not what I've seen. And, and as far as, what was the other question about, about the press there? Well, just the you, you mentioned the diversity. Obviously, you treat diversity as a diversity of ideas. Well, you know, the, it's, it's, very, it's very oppressive. I mean, I, I keep up on what's happening there. It's, it's incredibly oppressive. The current regime, you know, if, if you're a journalist, uh, you know, the amount of censorship pales compared to the amount of self-vetting 
I mean, they know what the rules are culturally. They grow up in that culture. They know what the, that it, the certain things, if they write them, they're going to draw down the wrath of the party on them. So they don't even write them. They don't even report them. I mean, when I was there, I had a student. They, we were doing investigative projects. I was an investigative reporter for the Washington Post on a Fulbright training Chinese journalists in 85, 86. Talk about a bizarre scenario. And I had one, a student that did a project on how at the Beijing International Airport they were diluting fuel to make it go further. Okay? Now that's a story that has to do with safety and security and all kinds of things. And a vice premier of the country contacted the school and had the story killed and the student taken off the story. So, you know, that just gives you a flavor of the degree to which they monitor things. Every morning when I came in to my desk, 85, 86, and you know, China's a different China, but in the way that I'm about to tell you, it's not different, it's the same. I would come to my office every morning and there'd be a stack of papers about this high, blue, and they'd be stamped NABU. Any of you speak uh, Mandarin in here? No? Okay. Well, it, it means internal use only. It's a low form of classification. And what it means is that what was on my desk, I couldn't share with my Chinese colleagues. It was okay for me, as an American journalist and professor in residence, to read it, but I couldn't tell my colleagues what it was. What was it? It was the overnight reports of the Associated Press. In a journalism school, I couldn't share it with my colleagues. You know? Was there... Someone? No? Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank you very much for being so attentive. I deeply appreciate it.